Welcome to Career Explorer Live. My name is Tina Swanick, I'm the Career Explorer Northwest Educator Producer for KSPS PBS Public Television here in Spokane, Washington. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, Career Explorer Live is an interactive Zoom event that connects young people with professionals so they can learn about careers and career paths. And today we're going to be learning about veterinarian careers with the help of our special guest, Dr. Jill Swanick from Swanick Veterinary Service in Lamont, Washington. Uh, Dr. Jill was born in Monroe, Washington, and she knew from the age of seven that she wanted to be a veterinarian. She grew up on a small dairy farm on Woods Creek, milking Ayrshire cows, raising North Country, country Cheviot sheep, pigs, goats, poultry, dogs, and Abyssinian cats. In 1991, Dr. Jill earned her Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree from Washington State University, um, College of Veterinary Medicine. And in 1992, she started Swanick Veterinary Services, a rural mixed animal practice in Sprague, Washington. And Dr. Jill's practice has grown to employ three veterinarians, including her daughter, Dr. Leah Swanick, keeping it all in the family. Together, they serve ambulatory clients within a 60-mile radius and all who visit the clinic in Lamont. Welcome, Dr. Jill. Thank you. And also with us today, we have two participating schools. On the left of the screen is Gonzaga Preparatory School, and uh, along with their college counselor, Kathy McMeekin. And then on the right-hand side, we have veterinary assisting program students from New Tech Prep, along with their instructor, Kim Coleman. Thank you all for being with us today. Before we get started, I wanted to quickly share the agenda for today's event. Um, first, Dr. Jill will tell us a little bit about how she uh, decided to become a veterinarian and maybe a little bit more about her career path to becoming one. And then we'll open the floor to our student guests from New Tech Prep and Gonzaga Prep. And we won't be taking any questions through the chat today because we'll be discuss engaging in this live discussion. So again, welcome Dr. Jill. And I'd like to turn the floor over to you to talk a little bit about um, how you decided to become a veterinarian and maybe a little bit more about your career path. Well, thank you, Tina. Um, so yeah, I decided to be a veterinarian when I was seven years old. I was in the dairy barn at the Evergreen State Fair in Monroe, and somebody said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, I'll be a veterinarian. Um, and so that's the path I took, um, active in 4-H, active in FFA, um, honors student, went to WSU, uh, did the honors program for a while till I figured out that it took more classes to go through honors than it did to just get into veterinary school. So I dropped out of honors and, and took my uh, classes just to uh, get into vet school. And that that's something that you guys should consider if you're looking to go to vet school is that they have very specific classes that you need to take, 30 hours of science and chemistry, uh, physics, those sorts of things. And then 30 hours, they don't care what they are and you do not need an undergraduate degree. And so I did three years of undergraduate studies and was accepted into vet school um, without an interview and did four years in vet school, went to uh, work for Colville Animal Hospital for a year just to get some experience and then opened my own practice. So that was kind of my path. Um, I am the kind of person that, you know, just is maybe determined um, and really didn't have any difficulty with it. I did not do the pre-vet type programs. I did microbiology. Um, I like things that are a little more rigorous and I, you know, to this day, you know, bugs and viruses are a big part of the job that I do. And so I don't regret that part of my education. Um, opened my own practice, was a solo vet, raised three children. Um, I'm a farmer, I'm a rancher, I'm a mother. Um, I just, I've kind of done it all and, um, and I've enjoyed it all. The diversity I think has, has been key to me. I'm a, I like puzzles and I'm a problem solver and that's really important if you're headed into vet medicine. Um, to, to think about what your strengths are. Uh, vet medicine is very diverse. You know, if you want to be a, a dentist for uh, animals, you go to vet school. You know, um, if you want to do surgery, if you want to do medicine, if you want to do food safety, I mean, the, the career is huge. The opportunities are huge. You can do research, you can do teaching. Um, the, uh, the needs right now um, are unmet. And so it's a, a career that has a a uh, strong demand and, and right now really good salaries. 
So let's get to your questions. Um, I, to me, it's enough about me. <laughs> Fantastic. I will go ahead and unmute our uh, student participants. And uh, the way that we'll approach the question and answer session of our event um, is I will basically start with a question from New Tech Prep and then we'll alternate between schools. Um, to the point where perhaps you don't have any additional questions. And then um, I'll give an opportunity for um, Dr. Jill to share maybe any information that she feels you still need to know after she's answered all of the questions and given you all of that information. So let's start with a question from our students at New Tech Prep. What would be one thing you would do differently in your past, given what you know now? You know, I don't look back and have any regrets. Um, I graduated debt free. Uh, I have strong family ties. I have a strong, strong church. I have strong ties to my community. I really don't look back and say I would have done something differently. Um, I may be an, unusual in that, but you know, I I really like what I do. I like who I am. Um, I read a lot of uh, books. I do self help books. I do. You know, the education I have, I'm continually learning. As you guys all know, medicine changes every day. Um, I like that challenge. Um, and yeah, so I don't know there's not a lot I would do differently. I, I really I've got a nice family. I don't have a lot of regrets, but I brought them all to work with me. I raised my kids. You know, I didn't send them to daycare. I didn't, I, yeah. So as you learn more about me, you, you probably will see that, but there's nothing that I look back and say, gosh, I really wish I'd done that differently. All right, fantastic. Uh, Gonzaga Prep, do you have a student a uh, question for Dr. Jill? Um, what was the process like after college, like finding a job and getting into like the um, business of veterinary? Okay, that's a great question. So when I was in vet school, and those of you that go that direction, part of your senior year, you have to go out and work in private practices. And so I went to a practice up in Colville um, for a like a two week period and be a volunteer essentially, um, but stayed with them and they offered me a job. They were a three man practice and were looking at hiring their very first woman. And so I came into that role and um, so that's how I got my first job. Essentially it was offered to me before I graduated. That's fairly typical of the job um, market today. You can find a job before you graduate. Um, and then I, you know, worked there, got my clinical skills better, animal handling, just that knowledge, uh, where to look things up. You, you meet some mentors and they help you. Um, and, uh, and then business-wise, I knew because I had married a farmer that I was going to live rurally. And so then you make that decision. Do you want to commute to the city an hour every day or do you want to work for yourself? And I decided I didn't want to make the commute. I would work for myself. So I took some classes on accounting. Um, and started to work on kind of some, some business skills that you're not taught in vet school. Um, uh, brought speakers into the vet school to talk on veterinary business, learn the laws in the state of Washington, that kind of stuff. So that, that's, that was my path. Next question from New Tech Prep. What are the most common and uncommon animals that you work on in your area? Okay, so the very most common animal is, come on guys, dogs. We see more more dogs. Everybody has a dog. Their friend has a dog. Some people have 11 puppies. <laughs> I'll give my staff in yeah, case anybody needs a puppy. Um, and then uncommon, you know, I started my career as, as that first woman, new person in the practice when llamas and alpacas were popular. And as that new person in the practice, you get everything everybody else doesn't want to see. So you get really ha good at handling, you know, fractious cats. Um, did a lot of the small ruminant work. When I opened here in Sprague, bison were big, and I did a ton of bison work, um, blood tests, TB tests, um, pegging, tattooing, semen testing, international health certificates, uh, you know, hours and hours of paperwork. And then today, I mean, I did, I did abdominal surgery on a hamster with a hernia. Um, you know, I had to tape him to the table because when you pull the suture up, he, uh, he came off the table. Um, I see some snakes. I see a lot of chickens. We're getting a lot of backyard chickens right now. Um, so pretty much we see anything that comes in the door. Um, we'll give it, a, we'll give it a go. If, you know, if we know that there's better expertise in other areas, we'll send them that way. We've got some really good exotic vets in Spokane. We've got some good exotic vets down in um, Pullman. 
and some people just you know need something seen right away and you know we do we do birds um yeah snakes just about anything but dogs are your very most common and then yeah you go from there what were like the things that you like most to work with and like what you least like to work with mm. well i'm an introvert so the one i had to learn to work with was people and uh read books to get better at working with people um i like to work with the diversity um you know, there's there's good dogs and bad dogs. There's good cats and bad cats. There's good horses and bad horses. You know, cows are typically easy because we put them in a restraining device and they can't do much to you. That being said, they have put me over a fence or two. Um, you, you know, you learn to be a hurdler. So I don't have a, I mean, I guess if I had a preference, I really like my sheep and goats. Um, that small room in it is a lot of fun. You can do a lot of work on them by yourself. Um, you don't need so many uh, pieces of equipment to handle them. But um, yeah, I, they're all fun. Um, yeah, I, I enjoy what I do and I like the diversity. Hey, New Tech Prep, next question. As a rule, <clears throat> as a rule veterinarian, has there ever been a case that required some equipment or supplies that you didn't have? And how did you get over that? I read that question earlier and I, I had to laugh. I, that's like every day. Um, you know, we make do with what we have on hand every day, every case, um, every time we go out in the field. Um, so, uh, you know, the other day I had a prolapse down in the Thule's on a ranch and I'd ask, you know, could they get her up, but they couldn't. And so, you know, you pull up, you get out of your truck, you stay back because you don't want to spook her and make her get up and run because you can tear her prolapse. I've seen that where they take one jump and the whole uterus comes off. Um, and, uh, you know, so, you know, you rope her, the cowboys, you know, jump on her, you clean everything up, um, you know, put it back in, stitch it up and, you know, she gets up and walks off. I mean, it, it, you just, you, every, every single case, and maybe it's more true of large animals than small, but I had a chicken in here, like a week old chick with a, a bad hawk, you know, like your ankle joint, um, swollen vent off to the side. He couldn't use it. Paper clip and some tape. And we made him a splint and we talked about how she needs to kind of keep him in a cup so that leg can't just keep going out so he learns to actually get it under him and use him um yeah every day I, it's just fun um and uh yeah you get to be very good at, at improvising you you know your clients will help you they'll have ideas um your staff will help you they'll have ideas yeah wow oh, it's just yeah it's like i say it's a puzzle it's part of why we like what we do okay gonzaga prep next question what experiences in undergrad are helpful if you attend to apply to a veterinarian graduate program? Okay. Um, any animal experience is helpful and they will count any animal experience. So those of you that are truly looking to go to vet school, you know, keep track of those hours and log them. Get into as many different types of practices you can to see what they do. Um, the vet schools really like to see that you have a broad focus, that you truly understand what this degree can offer you. And uh, we went through that a couple of years ago with my daughter and they're like, yeah, you know, she needs to go do something that, you know, that your mom doesn't do. And so we kind of scratched our heads and we sent her to some specialty clinics um, to see some of that sort of, uh, of things and um, veterinary specialists in Spokane and the uh, veterinary um, imaging specialists uh, just, just, to, just to broaden things out. She did some stuff with USDA to look into the research aspect of it. So any, any animal experience they're really looking for, they, they like to know that you've done more than just went to an exotics clinic and did more than just dogs, right? Um, you know, ride around with a horse vet, go out and work on a cattle farm, all that stuff they take into, uh, to account. So. <clears throat> Gonzaga, were you asking about classes as well? Yes. Okay. Um, classes, you're going to have to be strong in science, right? Um, math, science, chemistry, biochemistry, ochem, you've got to pass all of those classes. Uh, and then, um, you know, at WSU, grades are really, really important to get in. Um, other schools, not so much. There's a push now to try and find more people like me that will do rural practice. And Texas Tech has a program now, and Kansas has a program. Um, where they don't maybe put quite as much emphasis on grades, 
but more on, you know, do you want to live rurally or do you want to be out in the country? Because we've got quite a shortage of veterinarians that will work out in the country. Um, and that becomes a, uh, a food safety, national security type of a thing. You know, when we get avian influenza in and you see them destroying these flocks of birds, it's the veterinarians that are out there identifying that. Um, and uh, swine fever, African swine fever, they're really worried about now. So um, your science and math classes is where it's really going to be at. And like I said, for WSU to get admitted to vet school, you only need 60 hours. So that's two years of college, not four. Um, and so if you're really looking at going this direction, figure out which colleges you want to go to, get in with their admission people and find out what classes they're going to want because you don't need a four-year degree to get into vet school, okay? I graduated debt-free. Uh, my daughter graduated debt-free. Uh, it's possible, but you've really got a plan. Really interesting. Um, New Tech, do you have another question? Yes. So um, my next question is, what's the furthest you've driven on farm call? Well, I'm only licensed in Washington. So I, you know, I have to kind of stay in Washington. Um, I did a farm call to Montana one time when I was delivering sheep and toured the facilities and then did telecom telemed with him uh, with some problems after that. Um, I've done exams on sheep in Hawaii when we were on vacation. They had a, a Hawaii Sheep Association had a meeting and we attended it and uh, and got to know some people there and looked at some sheep. So, you know, I try and stay in this 60 mile radius. We'll be going to Mabton this weekend. And so that's outside of that radius. It's a once a year, we go down and ultrasound a couple thousand head of sheep. And then I teach a lambing school for the Washington State Sheep Producers. And so we kind of tie that into a um, one big farm call. And, uh, but if I go one hour, you know, east, and then I've got clients one hour west, I'm two hours away. And so that's why I try and kind of stay in that 60 mile radius as much as I can. Okay, next question, Gonzaga. Did you ever consider specializing in one type of animal, like just large animals or just small animals? No, because I married a farmer out here in the Palouse and I knew that wouldn't be possible. Um, just, yeah, and I, I grew up raising and showing cats and dogs. I grew up raising and showing cattle and sheep. We did some horses, um, mostly Jim Canna's and the Bay Area shows. And so I personally have worked with all those animals before I ever started vet school. Hey, New Tech Prep. What's the most unique case you've gotten to work on? Unique in what way? Um, Just like your favorite, maybe? In animal? It's us, in uh, animal. Okay. Um, the ones that you remember are maybe the ones that you have the least control over. Um, I, I just, I really like kind of all of it. Um, you know, I, I get the ability to be with them at the beginning. We do cesareans, um, cows, sheep, goats, um, cats and dogs, horses. I would refer, that's a really tricky surgery to anesthetize a horse. You need a lot more people than one person to do it. Um, and then I go all the way to end of life where we, we euthanize animals and put them down. And I do in-home euthanasias. I come to people's houses and the pets on their bed in their favorite room. Uh, you know, and it's all very, very special and very touching. And it's a way I support my community. Um, you know, the, the things that you might remember are the things that maybe aggravate you the most. Um, and that will happen to all of us. When I was a, a new vet in Colville, I got a, and I was the only one in clinic that day. I got a call from a girl, or the clinic did, a uh, teenage girl. She was frantic, just frantic. Her dad's horse was in the bridge. And so they sent me out to uh, to see the horse in the bridge. But they said, it's at the old racetrack. And I'm like, there's no racetrack in Colville. So the tech went with me to show me where the old racetrack was. And, um, and it was just a grassy field. At one point, it, I think it was a dirt track or something. But Anyhow, here was this thoroughbred mare that had fallen through an old wooden bridge and she was hanging over a creek, probably 15 feet in the air. She was impaled, the boards had rotted, and she was impaled three to four inches on the old spikes they used to nail the planks down. Um, and I'm out there with my, my tech um, and you know the mare is stuck in the bridge and I've got two teenage girls, right? And so it's like, what do you do? I mean, what can you do? So. We, we sedate the mare, we get her some pain meds, 
Um, my tech says, you know what, I'll, I'll run back to the clinic. I'll see if I can find somebody else. Maybe my husband can come, you know, and, and to help us figure out how to get this horse that's impaled on this log off the bridge. So my tech drives off with my truck. So now I'm here with just two teenage girls and a horse in the bridge. And you can see her ribs. There's been so much damage, the muscles are cut and you can see her ribs and you're just hoping she doesn't poke into her lungs. And, and I've got her pretty well asleep. And the owner of this horse shows up and he's just like mad at his daughters because they left the gate open and they let the horse out and everything's horrible. And they're screaming and yelling at each other. And I'm, you know, this, this new vet and I'm young and I'm just like, oh my gosh, I'm in the middle of this family fight. And it's, it was just really scary. And, and, uh, and he's like, you know, I, I'll get the chainsaw and we'll cut the logs and we'll drop this horse into the, into the, you know, into the river. And, um, and then we had the whole discussion about physics. And this is why we have to take a physics class is they really believed that they were going to drop this horse into this, this creek um, and pull her upstream onto the grassy bank. And I said, no, when she hits the water, she's asleep anyhow, or mostly she's going to float downstream. It's a given. And so we had an argument about that. until I finally convinced them that, yeah, that she was going to go downstream. So he goes to the back of this little pickup and I'm still here by myself, right? And he pulls out a chainsaw. Well, there's no gas in it. So he siphons some gas out of his truck to start the chainsaw. About then his mother shows up. Now she owns the bridge, okay? And she decides that he is not allowed to cut the bridge because it is her bridge. And I'm still there by myself, right? In the middle of this family food and they're screaming, yelling about, you know, so-and-so in the back hills. And, you know, this bridge I don't think has been used in, half a century, but it's very important to her right now. And he literally has starting his chainsaw because he's going to get this horse out of the bridge. And he's got his mother by the shoulders yelling at her that he's going to start this, this, you know, he's going to get the horse out of the bridge and he's got a running chainsaw. And I'm just thinking, I sure hope I don't see a massacre. <laughs> uh, just really scary. Um, yeah. Just, I mean, people are amazing. And so finally they settle down and I'm just like, you know, we have to get the horse out of the bridge. So he goes up with his chainsaw. He literally, and he is a lumberjack. He cuts that log such that it drops front to back in one piece. The log and the horse hit the water and separate. I, I mean, it was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. His skill set was fantastic. So the horse floats downstream to the gravel bar, and the girls have the rope, and they're pulling on the rope trying to get the horse out of the out of the stream. And of course, she's on her side with the wound down on the sandbar. And she's struggling, trying to get her feet under her. And it's like, if she could just have her head, she would get up. But they're pulling on her head, so she can't get her head leveraged to get up. To, and I'm so I'm screaming at the top of my lungs, let her go, let her go, drop the rope, you know. And so finally they hear me and let go. And she stands up and walks out. And the wound is horribly filthy, dirty with rocks and gravel. And he wants me to sew her up. And I'm like, we can't, you know, it needs to go to the clinic. It's such a big wound and it's so dirty. You know, we had a full surgery at Colville for horses. And, uh, um, and he's just like, you know, no, you just need to do something. I'm like, you know, my truck's not here. I can't do it. My partner shows up and he's a horse vet and he takes one look at the wound and he says, we need a horse trailer. She's got to go to the clinic. And I swear that horse trailer appeared. And that's the difference back then between men and women. What he asked for, you know, he got, and what I asked for, I didn't. Um, and then it was like, they get the horse trailer there and they all disappear. And he and I are loading this horse, which was kind of odd. Um, but we, we took her in, we cleaned her up. She survived the surgery. Uh, the next morning, the only thing he cared about was, was she pregnant? So I had to go in and, and palpate that mare to let him know that she was still pregnant. So, um, you know, every, every case is different. And some of them, those ones that do aggravate you will stay with you forever. Okay. Uh, not, not a, I mean, it's just not a better career. I love it. And this is where those people skills come in on a daily basis as well. Yeah. Uh, Gonzaga Prep, next question. I just have one question about you. You were talking about vet schools and how they differ um, in admissions. Do all do all of them admit students who are who do not have an undergraduate degree, or does that depend on institution? I would depend on institutions, but most all of them will. They will have different requirements for those um, undergrad hours. So WSU requires a half a year of physics. Um, other schools like Colorado, um, and don't quote me on Colorado, but they will require a full year of physics. So you really need to, before you get into college, kind of look at those schools that you're interested in 
and find out what they truly require. They're all gonna require your basic chemistry. They're all gonna require your basic biology, um, but there will be some differences. New Tech, do you have another question? There's something that you wish more pet owners know. Oh my gosh, that list is way too long for this seminar. <laughs> um, it, there's, there's so many things that, that, yeah, pet owners don't know or don't understand. Um, you know, right now, the big one, if you're online at all, is that, you know, pet food is so bad for your dog and Karina's got all these problems and, and um, there's some websites you can actually go to and look at who has the most recalls, right? Who has foods that truly have problems in them and Karina's not one of them. Um, but I have a, had a client that was really worried about that. And so she sent me this article because look, my, this lady said on NBC or ABC that her two dogs both died after eating Karina pet food. And so I'm like, oh, okay, I'll go read this article. And so I bring it up. And as I'm reading through it, the first dog that died was their 14 year old Rottweiler. Well, big dogs don't live long lives. And I don't know that in my practicing years, I've ever had a 14 year old Rottweiler. I mean, they're usually gone between eight and 10 years. And so I'm like, well, there's one for Purina food. That dog stayed alive a long time. And then their second dog died within a couple months of the first dog. Um, and I think, I think we see some of that just like we do in people. When you've got a bonded pair and you lose one, that grieving is real for pets and for people. Um, but that second dog died. And uh, that was a 17-year-old dachshund. So again, well past where we would expect a dachshund. I mean, they often, their backs go out. I mean, so many things happen to dachshunds and that that family kept that dog that healthy on Prina food for 17 years is remarkable too. So um, I guess I, one thing I would love is if people just didn't use social media so much to make their um, life decisions and, and judgment calls and to actually get into what we would might call evidence-based medicine and, and see what the true statistics are on things. Um, but, you know, keeping pets at a healthy weight, huge, all your animals. When we are overweight, we have problems. I have one client that likes her animals really, really thin. And I have animals, you know, then health issues with that too, because they don't heal as well. They have no reserves. And we've had that discussion. So um, there's just so many things out there and things are changing. You know, get regular checkups. Check in with your healthcare team. We're here to help you. Sounds like a prep. Do you have another question for Dr. Jill? When you set up your business, besides learning about how to run a business, what were some other challenges to just setting up your independent practice? Um, the biggest challenge is I did an SBA loan to start with. Um, and they, you know, they want all these numbers and, and I'm pulling them out of the air because I've never had a practice before. And then they're like, oh, those aren't good enough. And so you do it again and you, you know, make these models. And then when we actually went in and signed the paperwork, they used my first sketches. So it's like, ah, dang it, all those hours for nothing. Um, you know, hiring people can be difficult. Finding that right person, you really want to find someone that's trainable, that, uh, you know, likes people and animals, depending on what job you put them in. Um, but, you know, the companies that support the vet industry are very supportive of new businesses. And uh, I just, you know, there's so many nice resources out there. So it, it wasn't, it, I don't know, I wasn't intimidated by it. I, I really just jumped in and went for it. Problem solving. Mm -hmm. yeah. New tech. Do you have another question for Dr. Jill? Since you like microbiology, do you have a favorite organism or disease that you're intrigued by? Mm. It's usually, you know, whichever one I'm working with at the time. Right now, um, immunology. I just really am loving what we're learning about immunology. Um, did some continuing education on it last week and, um, antigen interference and dominant antigens and how that affects our immune system. Um, you know, we're, we're going to these, these shots that have all of these things in them. So it's convenient. You get one shot and you're done. And now we're learning that, that the immune system doesn't work well that way. And we're better off to get multiple shots and break them up. And um, how that, how that immune dominance affects what your macrophages will pick up and how they present things. And so, yeah, right now I'm just loving immunology um, micro, Minerals play a huge role in it. And we have an area in this uh, state that's deficient in selenium and copper and zinc. And so I'm always talking microminerals and it's kind of fun to add to that, the role that vitamin A plays where we have a drought, we have not enough vitamin A in our forages. And so all our livestock are vitamin A deficient that affects your um, kill zone in the gut and in the trachea um, along with zinc. Those two play a, a huge role. So yeah, right now I'm, I'm really into immunology. 
Fonseca. No other questions for us. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, New Tech, do you have additional questions for Dr. Jill? No, I think we're good. You're good? Mm -hmm. I have one quick question for you, Dr. Jill. Um, how do you see technology changing veterinary medicine? It's going to change all of our lives. So, you know, we're using um, some of our AI capabilities to get a list of probable diagnoses. You know, we can use them to, to make a website for us. We can use it to do staff manuals and we can use it to do staff scheduling. I mean, it's, it's pretty remarkable. You know, it's, it's accurate about 89% of the time. And so you still kind of have to know when it's not accurate. Um, it doesn't know what it doesn't know. And then it teaches itself more things that it doesn't know. So that's the scary part in the medicine part of it is, is you, you have to tell it to use specific references so that it doesn't just pull up things that are out there um, that someone has maybe made up or it has made up. You know, it's having trouble doing math right now, right? AI doesn't do well with math. So, um, yeah, it um, it can save us some time, like I say, with those differential lists. Um, and then it's kind of up to us and the patient and the client to decide, you know, what other tests we want to do and, and where we want to go with this animal. Um, one of the big things that I try and do is, is to make my care um, compassionate with whoever's animal that is and what they can afford and what they're comfortable with and not put my decisions on them and try not to take options away from them. And that can be uh, difficult. You know, we have this whole push to, to do gold standard medicine and do the best we can. And it's like, but we can do good medicine and do a fantastic job for that animal, for that client without, you know, breaking the bank, so to say, um, and making them feel like, you know, they're doing the best they can within their means for their patient and not passing a judgment on them because, you know, they're not a millionaire and they can't do everything. So, okay, that helps. It does. Is there anything else you feel that students need to know to make a good decision about whether they should pursue a career in veterinary medicine? Well, I think we'll go back to some of the things I talked about. You know, do you like puzzles? Do you like interacting with people and animals? I mean, if you, if you don't, but you want to help mankind and you like microbiology, or, there's huge research things, right? The Army uses veterinarians. Um, they do their food safety. They take care of their, their dogs and their horses. Um, so it's such a broad uh, career that you don't, you, know, you don't have to just think, oh, I'm just going to go into a clinic and be a doctor. Um, you can do strictly house call. You can do strictly cats. Um, it's, just, you know, it's just huge um, what, what we do or can do. And, um, and then the big thing that I would caution all of you is debt. Um, really avoid debt because it limits your options when you get out of school. Um, my daughter had a friend that graduated with her and, you know, she had the, she wanted to work mixed practice. And so she took a little lower salary because we tend to make a little less out in the country. And she had to reschedule her student debt because she couldn't afford to rent a house and make her loan payments. Um, since then, she's added some extra shifts and she's got her debt paid down really, really well. But when she first came out, it was pretty overwhelming. So, you know, write for those scholarships, you know, try and find those colleges that maybe are a little less money for you. Um, my daughter went to Bozeman for her undergraduate. It was less money in Bozeman out of state on their witchy or wooey program than it was to go to um, WSU. So um, there's just a lot of, lot of options out there and just spend some time on the computer and, and start exploring them. Because like I said, debt really limits your options. Do your budgets, you know, understand how you're gonna, you know, make things uh, work for you. Um, and then, yeah, get out and visit other practices. And you, every day is different. I've got, stories galore and I love them and I love my clients. Um, like I say, it is it's truly a, uh, a rewarding profession. And I think some of you are in the vet tech program. Um, I do have a licensed vet tech here and she is invaluable. Um, she places my catheter, she runs my anesthesia. She um, sometimes will, you know, suit your clothes for me when we're really, really busy. Um, and she does, you know, assessments on animals. She makes callbacks to people. Uh, basically she can do just about everything, but the diagnosis and the surgery, uh, and just, you know, she is truly invaluable. 
We do uh, some abdominal surgeries in horses here standing. She runs all of that for us. Um, yeah, just it's a it's a great profession. And you know, her take on it is she didn't really have the grades and the knowledge to know everything that I know, but she just really loves helping people and helping animals and and knowing what she does know and how to run, you know, anesthesia and take X-rays and all of that stuff. I mean, she's she's very very happy with her career choice. Um, she did the school down in Yakima, so. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Jill. I think we're getting to the end of our program here. So I want to take just a couple of minutes to thank you for all the time, wisdom, information, stories you've shared with us today. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Kim Coleman and the New Tech Vet Assisting Program for joining us as well. We really appreciate you being here. And also Kathy McMeekin and her students from Gonzaga Prep for participating today. So I'm going to, um, that's going to wrap up our event, our Career Explore Live event for today. Thank you again for being here. We appreciate your time and your very thoughtful, uh, well-constructed questions for our guests.